Welcome uh, to this um, Zoom session on the Brazilian modernism of Roberto Berlimarx. This is a session about a work in progress, a catalog that has been uh, about six years uh, in the works and an exhibition on the jewelry of the Berle Marx brothers from Brazil, Roberto Berle Marx and Haroldo Berle Marx. Um, I'm Manas uh, Ispahani Bartos from Manas Collection in New York. And my colleague Isabella Ono is the executive director of the Berle Marx Institute in Rio, and she's also the executive director of the Berle Marx Landscape Design in Studio. So she brings an enormous amount of expertise uh, to this panel as well. Um, both Isabella and I are, con are contributors to the catalog, along with several others. Today, however, we are going to concentrate on only one Burley Marx brother. Um, many people who know a little bit about this family may remember the Time magazine quote in 1965, where um, they were called the most amazing and talented brother act in Brazil. Um, perhaps the most talented in fact, certainly the most gifted of all the brothers was the person we're going to talk about today, uh, Roberto Berlin Marx. And we'd like to try to give you a sense of who he was, what his place is in the global lexicon of landscape architecture, and importantly for us, in relation to the design of jewelry. Um, he was many other things, and Isabella will uh, refer to them, but in the short time we have allotted to us, uh, these are the two areas that I think we will cover, and um, you'll see why as the uh, PowerPoint presentation unfolds. I'll start off by saying that, please change this. I'll start off by saying that ever since I bought, here's a, a, a wonderful image of, of Roberto, one of my favorites, um, with these folk figures that he collected. Um, you can change the image. And Isabella put together this wonderful collage of all the different metiers in which he was involved. Um, and you get a sense of them here. But if you go to the next slide, you'll see a ring very much uh, like my first ring that I purchased um, about 10 years ago, a Berlin Marx ring. And it made me um, an absolute devotee of this, this work. I found it... Um, an astonishing mix of um, some sort of ancient, some reference to an ancient time with um, a very modern moment. It had, uh, it was completely original given that it was made 70 years ago uh, at a time when people were wearing delicate diamonds uh, placed in platinum or white gold um, embraces. And, and I looked at this ring and I thought, you know, and there was this astonishing uh, Brazilian aquamarine that was cut in, in a way I had not then seen a stone cut. So it led me, this ring, down what you might almost call a rabbit hole, but it led me to really on a quest um, to search out all the best uh, Berlin Marx jewelry that I could uh, literally lay my hands on, handle, uh, wear, feel on the collarbone, get a sense of how it gripped the wrist, 
um, recognized that each piece was handmade, um, each piece was unique, um, that the design uh, of these pieces was something that I had not seen anywhere else and I had not seen imitated. Um, these were very unique and special pieces. Um, I tried, I started to read, reach out to the families. Um, basically, uh, Manaus collection became sort of um, the, the central place where we handled, I think, more Burley Marks jewelry than almost anyone I can think of, um, certainly in the United States. Um, Roberto's work in jewelry was very much tied to his work in other fields. And as I started to study these other areas and get to know people like Isabella, who really knows this material and others, I really saw the connections in the design world between his work in various genres. Um, there was such a clear um, symbiosis, such a clear relationship between uh, his drawings uh, in textiles, his drawings of jewelry, his the way he designed. He was an artist who made jewelry. And that's something I hope you will really take away from this uh, session uh, because it's a very important point. We speak about all these great artists who made jewelry, people's names who are most commonly mentioned, the French, uh, Picasso and Braque and Max Ernst, et cetera. And, the Italian jewelers, Afro and Canela and others. But Burley Marx was um, a genius unto himself. He was an artist who made jewelry of the most extraordinary kind. And it completely related to his overall body of work. This jewelry was manufactured in the workshop of his brother, younger brother, Haroldo Berle Marx, who also retailed the jewelry. Um, so I would say that, you know, this image is something I, I hope you will keep in mind, because even though the collaboration between the brothers and the fact that Roberto was a very prolific person in many fields for many years. He only spent maybe 10 years designing jewelry. He had a profound impact on this brand called Burley Marks Jewelry, which continued uh, far uh, longer than his involvement with it. Um, so at Manas Collection, you know, we pride ourselves not only being a, a selling gallery, but on building knowledge about important makers who may not have been given necessarily their, uh, the time and the sun that they deserve. And we have felt that Berle Marx, Roberto, we call him Burle Marx, but Roberto Burle Marx certainly deserves uh, uh, his time in the sun as a jewelry artist, an artist who made jewelry. This is a, a piece of his that's in the Art Institute of Chicago, which I particularly love and brings to mind so many pieces of jewelry in our collection. Um, if you could change it. Um, there's one, one sort of last thing that I want to say about the jewelry, um, and then I would like to hand it over to Isabella, which is, you're probably wondering, who are these guys? And what do they have to do with the jewelry? Um, so on your left, I think, is Hans Stern, and on your right is Alexander, um, 
Alexander's, Amsterdam Sour, I'm sorry. Um, and, and this, they were part of a group that came to Brazil early um, and became involved in the discovery of uh, Brazil's gemstones, um, started getting involved with mining and looking for uh, quality gems in Brazil itself, and a mine for aquamarines and many other stones. Amsterdam Sao claims to have uh, discovered the first emerald, and I believe the GIA accepts that um, that corroboration because before that they did not accept that these were emeralds from Brazil. Um, but Brazil has an enormous bounty of gemstones. And if you just go over the list, I started to put them down. Uh, aquamarines, emeralds, imperial topa topaz, uh, paraiba tourmaline, tourmalines, amethysts, aventurine, beryl of all kinds, carnelian, chalcedony, citrine, the list goes on. Why is this important? Um, it's important in the context of what we're speaking of today, because just as uh, Berlin, Roberto Berlimax tried to banish roses and begonias and all these sort of European flowers from the flower beds of the Brazilian elite and replace them with native plants and flora. So he went to natural stones from Brazil and used those. They decided to use those stones in their jewelry. You don't see diamonds until very late work by Haroldo Berlin Marx, but you never see diamonds in their work. Perhaps it was, you know, a, a client might have commissioned a piece by them, which they might have grudgingly made. But really what they wanted to show was the beauty of Brazil's own natural materials. So I'm going to stop there and say, you know, recently in, in this uh, climate, which has been very difficult in Brazil, um, like here and elsewhere in the world, um, there was a wonderful moment, which I know um, you celebrated, Isabella. Uh, the city of Berlin Marx, which was his home for a, a long time, Roberto's home, was made a world heritage site by UNESCO. And that is a very rare honor, especially for a personal uh, personal sort of home-based site. Um, and I'm sure Isabella can tell us a lot more about it, but it gives you a sense of Roberto's place in Brazil. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that and take us into his work as a landscape architect, as an extraordinary contributor to public life in Brazil? Yes, we can, we can talk a little. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Isabella Ono. I'm a landscape architect from Brazil. So sorry for my English if it's not too okay, but let's continue. Burle Marx was a, an amazing person, a very, like a true visionary person. He was, as Mahana said, a multidisciplinary, a multiple artist. So he do uh, jewelry design, he did, a, uh, he was a painter, he was a bot botanist, and he was very well known for, as a landscape designer. He works uh, as a landscape as a form of art. So here's a drawing, a sketch for Flamengo's Park. And in the right uh, is the Copacabana Avenue that I will talk later. So we can do, we can go in for the other slide. So just to talk a little, he started uh, uh, to design gardens in the 30s, uh, third in 1930. And one of the first projects was in Recife in the Northeast of Brazil, 
where he started to use native plants. So he was like a environmentalist. So he started to study native plants and bring it to the, uh, for the urban area. Uh, this is the first drawings for this garden and then how it is today. So he, he see as Mahanas uh, was talking a little that he loves to use the, the Brazilian stones. He, I think he was a really a Brazilian person because he loves to use it. He, he was very proud of all the, the flora of Brazil. And for that, he was like a precursor of the teams of preservation and sustainability in Brazil. He, start, he started to talk about this in the 50s in, in talking the newspaper and to, to, to value all the, the native plants that we have in Brazil. And he was very proud of it. So he did a lot of excursions uh, in all, all around Brazil. Here are some pictures. And he went to do a lot of lectures to talk about uh, how, how to preserve the, our, our native plants and to criticize the devastation of, of all the, the, the biomas, especially in Brazil. So since in the 60s, 70s, he's, he already talked about that. So uh, this is very impressive to hear this. And uh, that we have, still have the same problems of uh, take care of our biomas. So we can uh, go to another slide. And Haru Yoshi was my father. He was uh, his creative partner for 30 years. So one, uh, one thing that is very important, Burle Max always worked with a group of persons, botanists, gardeners, partners, like a uh, landscape architect. So he do like a, a collective, a working together with a lot of collaborators. So it's very important to say that all the productions of the, his gardens, his landscape uh, design was made for a group, for a team. And Haru Yosh was the longer uh, partner that stayed with, with him, working with he, him as his uh, right hand. I, can, I think we can say that. And uh, he was, he used to say, Burle Marx used to say that he was uh, a son that he never had. So, uh, and it's funny because Burle Marx, I, I knew him when I was born. My father was already his partner. And it was very funny because Burle Marx is very uh, in, intense person, very strong, very, it's a, he's, he was a really an artist. And Haruyoshi is a Japanese, very controlled, very, but very focused in what he did. So they respect, it, respect each other. And it was a beautiful land, uh, partnership when they worked together. And Burle Max left the, the, his studio, studio for Haruyoshi continue to, to, de to develop new gardens and to take care of all his archives. So it's very nice, very beautiful, the, the story. And so I, I can say that he was a uh, uh, central person in the preservation of all this legacy, because when Burle Marx pass, passed away, he continued to promote the name of Burle Marx. He opened the studio for, for publications, for researchers, for exhibitions. So he helped in almost all, all actions to promote the, the, the Roberto's legacy. So he was involved in the exhibition of a Jewish museum in the MoMA, and so in, he continues until 2017 when Haruyoshi passed away. So, and in when he passed away, we started. We already started to talk with Haru about uh, what we're gonna do uh, to preserve all the archive because we have almost 120 thousands of items in the in the archive and it's a private archive because it's the the studio uh, is still open still doing a landscape project me and my partner uh, and uh, we just we we are just wondering what we're gonna do there's a lot of researchers there is a lot of things to do with all this historical material and we have to preserve but we don't know how to do that so uh, we can say that the, the, we, we started to think about the institute and to, to, it's a non-profit organization in Brazil. So we opened it in 2019. 
Uh, and then it's the, the purpose of the Institute is first to preserve all this material. We have like a rich collections, uh, not only the landscape project that is 2000 projects, landscape project, and that have more or less 2000, uh, 20,000 items, drawings, sketches. And of course there is the documents, the photos, and all this historical material, the clip, clippings of news, historical newspaper. So we decided to create the Institute to perpetuate all this living art of Borle Marx. Here we can see, just to, to approach from the, the Julie uh, team, uh, this is a drawing from 1940s, more or less, the Ministry of Education and Health. It's a garden, drawing, but it's almost like an art drawing. It's very beautiful. It belongs to our collection. And it's we can see all these uh, shapes, the organic forms that we will see in, in others, uh, others places that he, he planted. So this is the garden as it is. Mahnat, if you want to talk a little about B. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the Ministry of Education and Health. And the other slide. So you can say a little about the Julie. Well, this is a very early, these are very early pieces. Um, I think this is 1956. Um, and he's still exploring these amoeba-like shapes and forms. Um, they disappear later on <clears throat> in his work, but this is here with these cabochons. This is very early work and also re reflects, I think, the more organic phase in his landscape work, which was, I think, an early phase, the early phase of his work. Um, so this is all the garden that, uh, would you like to talk a little about this garden, Nahanas? No, oh, you can... talk about it. Okay. It's so okay. beautiful. It's yeah, so beautiful. It's... I'm just looking at it. So it's nice to see this is a garden in Rio. It's in Petropolis, in, in Rio de Janeiro. And it's one of the first challenge of Burle Marx because he designed for a friend, uh, Odette Monteiro is the name of... Uh, the lady, and it was in a valley, and it's all surrounded by the, the native uh, uh, forest of Atlantic forest, uh, Mata Atlantica. And so he decided to create like a big lake in the middle to reflect the, the, the landscape. And then he did a lot of organic shapes with color, texture, and volumes. So it's nice to see and to compare with other kind of arts that Burle Marx and his partner developed uh, in these years, because you can see the shape that he can not, re but he can reflect in the jewelry. You can see the geometric that you can see in the more mural. So it's nice to 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 do like a parallel. It's the same person that was thinking in uh, in how to. to how to design, he, he, he's an, he was an artist. So, and this is the drawing of this garden. So it's very clear the shapes and the organics uh, and the color. He's and of course- He's doing these amoeba shapes. Uh, and of course there is in two dimension when, he, when we draw like a landscape, we draw a, a garden, it's a, only in one, uh, in two dimension, but of course we are thinking in three, three, three dimensions. So we have the volume, we have the shadow, we have the light, we have the wind. So it's nice to understand. And when you have a, a, a piece uh, like a, a jewelry, you can also see the volume, the shade, the light. So it's nice to compare these. This is another garden from Cavanelles, the architecture was designed by Oscar Niemeyer. Uh, they have the same uh, challenge. It's in the valley also, and the architecture was perfect because only like, a, a, I think like that, it's beautiful. 
And in this garden, Burle Marx decided to do like organic uh, shape in front of the garden, very free form. And in the back, he decided to do like a very geometric uh, garden, in, like a chess, using two colors of grass. So it's nice to see how the artists provoke the, the sensation in the garden in two different ways. So in, a, a, in a other time, so they use the color, the volume, the, the shadow, the light to do that. It's an amazing project. Are we missing a piece here? We might be missing a second piece here, but this, this uh, we have two pieces in this set with these very enormous watermelon tourmalines. And um, they very much give you a feeling of the, the gardens we just saw. You know, in fact, they almost, the cut of this stone almost mimics that last garden that we just saw. Um, but we seem to have lost one of the images. No, it's, it's interesting to see how they cut the, the stone and to do like a, all, like a, a sculpture in the stone. It's more or less the same that what Borle Marx uh, intention when he did a, a garden with the shapes of the topography. So it's very nice in the jewelry, this volume in the stone. And I think it's not usual. So it's- Very unusual. Uh, so Situ, as you told, we are very proud of uh, the title that Situ received because Burle Marx, when he was alive, he donated the, the Situ, the place where he used to live, the place where he had uh, all the plants collection. So the, like his, his jewelry is the, oh, in, in situ. So he was very generous to donate this for, for the others because he became pub, a public space when he donated the place. And to receive the title, it's very important for, to, to be recognized, not in Brazil, but around the world. It's a, a, a UNESCO title. So it, we are very proud. And Sitio was the place where he, he, he continued to have all these plant uh, collections. And he's like, today it's like a museum that you can visit. It's more or less as he left the, the, his house, his nurse, nurseries and everything was there. So it's a very interesting place to visit. Is he buried there also? No, no. He was buried close to there in a cemetery. Okay. And the and Sitio was the place where Bole Marx used to take all these plants, to, to, where he took the plants from the native uh, biomas and tried to experiment there in Sitio to observe, to see how they, they grow. Uh, it's more or less like his laboratory. So it's a very interesting where he did all the experience to put in the garden. So. And we can see this mural here in, in granite, in stones. Uh, he used the facade of an old building in Rio that was uh, des destroyed and put this like an artwork. So all the time we can see the volume, we can see the geometry, we can see the, the empty and closed places with volumes, and we can see the, the, the sh shadow, the light. So everything we can see in the, in the jewelry, his jewelry work too, like a bracelet. Yes, that's it. <laughs> so it's the same, so the, hey the bracelet. Yep. No, you can say you, it's, you're better. This, this bracelet is very much reflective of several of his murals. I think this one, and then we'll see some coming up where you see the bracelets. Um, this is uh, UNESCO? Yes, this project was uh, the, the Patios uh, in UNESCO in Paris. So uh, the, he used this geometry to construct the place where the plant's gonna stay. And there is this color, each color in the left side, uh, it's one kind of plant, one kind of volume, and the blue part is uh, water. So he combines 
plants with co different colors, textures from the stone, from the, the pavement and the water. So, and, and again, the geometry, very uh, orth orth orthogonal geometry. Mm -hmm. And then look at that. So it's almost as if you can pluck that out of that. Can you go back one just to just show it together? You know, you just see the the shapes. And in this, uh, Julie, you can see also the texture in the gold because it's not flat. There is a texture. It's the same that he used to do in the gardens with the pavement, with a grass. Uh, so it's nice to see. It's the same art, artist. So. <laughs> And this is a garden for a farm. So you like this, this drawing? <laughs> I love this drawing. I asked especially for it to be put in here. And today yeah. I was working in the archive and I found a, a picture, an image of this garden. And it was very nice because it's Roberto and his friend, that is uh, Clemente Gomes, like this together and only like a very close friend in, in this garden that when they are building this, because this farm, we used to be a coffee farm. It's an old, an ancient uh, farm. And there is like a patterns where he put the, the coffee to dry. And there is a lot of water to clean the, the coffee. It's a coffee farm. So uh, they, preserve this, this, these stairs, and then use the water that is already there in the place and design all the geometric garden using plants and using uh, water again. So it's a very beautiful garden. I, I know this is a topic for another conversation, but I am very interested to learn more about how involved he was with water because there's always, some work with water in all many of his gardens where he really uses water as an integral part of his design yes he normally because it's not the landscape for us that learn with him was not only plants so it's uh we combine plants with water with air mm -hmm. with the space with stones but uh, everything that is on in the site. So it's interesting because since the beginning, he, he was already thinking in sustainability. So we use all the things that is already have in the site. So it's very, very, just, uh, very intelligent to use that. So yeah. it's the reason that we use water that is wonderful to use water in the garden to reflect the landscape, to the, the space was very more comfortable because the water, the sound is nice. Uh, but the, the really important thing that it's already have water in the place. It's not artificial, so. Right, right. Mm -hmm. This so is a panel uh, in Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. So having seen the previous images, I think there's not too much to say except just to pause for a moment and reflect on um, the way in which these pieces um, just seem pulled out of those landscapes and vice versa. The brooch is, is particularly uh, to me, resonant of the landscapes. Um, so it's nice and, to compare. And of, the, and of the UNESCO project. Hey, it's, it's nice to call, it's, it's, it's nice to compare that he can do like a mural that you, you we saw in the last slide, and he can do a small uh, object, very delicate, but using the same principles. So it's nice to see it. It's not the same thing. When you, you design a, a mural, it's one thing, have another uh, scale, have another purpose, but it's nice to see that it's the same person that was thinking in how 
how creative he can do doing different things. So you're right, and working at a small scale and a large scale are very different talents and very mm -hmm. diff different skills are involved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now you corrected me when I said this was a kind of landscape, but this is a hardscape. This is one of his most beautiful, magical spaces. Can you say, tell us a little about the Cope yes. Cabana? This is the, the, the most important avenue in Copacabana Beach. It's called Avenida Atlantica, and it was designed in 1970. And it was an amazing project because it takes uh, five kilometers of drawing, a pavement drawing, there is no, uh, it's, everything was a unique, a unique drawing. So it's like a, no an artistic, repeat. no repeat. It's an artistic panel for five kilometers. And it's the place where people can walk, people can rest because there is, there is places to sit. There is of course, uh, there is of course trees and shadow. So it's a very amazing, and it's very beautiful to see from the top. So I remember when I, when I was a, a little kid, we, co we used to walk only in the stones, in white stones, and then we jump for the black stones, and then we jump for the red stones. So it's a, like a playground for us to... <laughs> That's an early bracelet. Again, um, it reminded us of, could you go back one slide? Just reminded us again of some of the drawing um, on uh, the Copacabana. Another great early necklace, again, giving us a feel for for that place. So here we have um, three of the four brothers, Berlin Marx, um, and um, you have Haroldo looking at a piece of jewelry on uh, my right. And uh, you have Roberto on my left with um, his brother, Walter, his older brother. And um, I just put these photographs up because um, there's a brother missing here, but I put these photographs up because um, all three of these brothers had an American, um, had an involvement with, with the United States. <clears throat> Haroldo's was much later in life and on his own, in his 80s actually. Um, and, and this relationship was a very loving relationship, uh, which actually between uh, Roberto and Walter, and it brought Roberto to the States quite a lot um, on personal visits, sometimes to see an eye doctor um, for all sorts of different reasons. But uh, these two brothers really uh, cared for each other. And um, Walter was a great musician and chose to live his entire life actually in the US. So Roberto had a lot of reason to go there, but he never had any interest in living there. Um, it's odd though that given how often he was there and that he lectured at universities and received major awards, including uh, from the American Institute of Architects in 1965, others, um, that he wasn't uh, better known in the States. Um, and we really hope that all the work we do um, really 
brings to the fore the reputation of this man who, who was truly a great contributor, not only to the arts, but also the sciences. And in this very perilous time of um, in, you know, environmental degradation and need for sustainable practices, um, um, we, need, we need our heroes uh, from the past and heroines. Um, so I wanted, um, with Isabella's permission, to say just a few words about um, actually what's optimistic and exciting about what's happening in the US um, around Roberto. Um, he, this, um, for all my dealer friends out there, my colleagues in Miami, who are there a lot, and all my Miami friends, this is in your city. Uh, this is Biscayne Boulevard. It was started in 1988. And for many reasons, and many fits and starts, there was some sort of conclusion in 2020. It is easier to see the whole of it from the air, but this piece of work uh, by Berlin Marx is right there in your city. So please, if you have a chance, um, go take a look at it and take a look at the drawings and think about the, the Berlin Marx jewelry that you've handled um, and uh, the cabochons that sit atop some of the jewels. Um, it's a very, very beautiful moment in, in, um, in Miami. Um, this is a, a, an image from a, a very important exhibition that was done at MoMA in 1991. Um, and it was important for several reasons. It's very hard to do an exhibition of landscape architecture because by its nature, um, you can only show images rather than the real thing. But uh, MoMA did do a single person show of Werner Marx's work in 1991, way too late from my perspective, but there was a major show uh, with an important catalog. Um, after this show, there was sort of a silence for quite some years till this major show at the Jewish Museum in 2016, which really showed uh, the real range of Berlin Marx's work and where I had the privilege of shaking hands with uh, Isabella's father, uh, which was really a moment. Uh, and this, this is a necklace uh, from my personal collection that the uh, museum borrowed um, to show Roberto's jewelry designs in that um, museum show. And that show had a very important impact. Uh, this this uh, textile I find quite overwhelming in its it's absolutely stunning. Do you want to say something about it, Isabella? I remember that I visited the, this tapestry in the place where it is now uh, in Sant Andre, and they, they decided to restore the, this tapestry. So my father worked in this restoration. So it was very, uh, he was very proud to, to see this tapestry in New York. So, because it was like a, a, a huge mo movement to bring this artwork for New York. So it's okay. amazing. And we, we have in our archive, the five uh, studies of this, this tapestry, because it's, uh, it was decided to do, Bole Max tried to do other, uh, other uh, colors. So he was just in process thinking what he, he will do. And we have these five studies. So it's, it's very beautiful. 
Oh, it's, piece. It's, yeah. it's a magnificent piece. Um, and if you don't, haven't had the chance to see it, um, the catalog is probably still available. It's worth buying just to have a chance to look at all the beautiful work uh, that was shown at this collection. And many of these pieces uh, are in the collection of the Institute of Berlin Arts. Um, but this show um, was paralleled in a very small way, but by a show we did at roughly the same time on the jewelry, uh, just the jewelry of uh, the Berlin Marx brothers. And we, uh, you know, we felt that we ha didn't have a catalog. We normally always do a show with the catalog, but we were so excited. Uh, we had already collected quite a significant amount of jewelry. Um, we were able to acquire jewelry drawings. Uh, we were lucky to have Wright uh, and Richard Wright as a partner. Uh, he's in, they're an extraordinary uh, auction house out of Chicago and they had a beautiful space in the Gagosian building on Madison Avenue and they, gave us this space and our uh, 20th century uh, brought in this astonishing Brazilian furniture and wood sculptures. And it was really a very, very um, exciting and enthusiastically received uh, uh, ex exhibit. You know, we, we didn't know how it would be received, but it um, it was very well received, and um, that photograph is of uh, Haroldo's daughter Sonia Burle Marx, and she is wearing a pin made by her uncle uh, Roberto. Um, I think we have one or two more images from this. Um, this is just a, one of the jewelry drawings that we own, I believe. Yeah, this is one of ours. Look, I mean, the, the quality of, of Roberto's drawings is, is um, it's, they're almost as exquisite as the necklaces, although you'd rather have the necklace. And here are a few examples. Uh, I'm wearing these earrings, which of course, also reflect that wall at the city. Um, and um, you see some of the pieces that were in the show. Um, you can go on. The Jewish Museum show, I think, had such an impact that then the New York Botanical Gardens decided to do this astonishing show with uh, another protege of or um, follower of Roberto's, um, a landscape architect in Miami called Raymond Jungles, who helped design this. And again, Isabella was involved in this project. And it was held in 2019, where the entire the, the New York Botanical Gardens was transformed this part of it into sort of a living tribute to Roberto Burley Marx. Is there something you might add to that, Isabella? Yes, the exhibition was very great. And Raymond used to be a very clo close friend of Burle Marx uh, as a disciple of Burle Marx in, in, in US. So he, he did a tribute to Burle Marx in this, this uh, square that he designed. Uh, and very beautiful because he, he used, he brought some plants from Miami and there is some plants that have the name of Burle Marx. So uh, it's funny to see tropical plants in New York and to see some plants with the name of Burle Marx. And all the exhibition was very uh, well received very people love the, the 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 exhibition and uh, we participated in the first symposium in the beginning and in the end i was invited to do 
the uh, symposium in NYU. So it's we are very proud of all the the all the action. This growing significance of Berlin Marx's work in the States, the growing importance, there was a plethora of articles and essays and uh, books are now coming out on his work. Um, but the last um, little gem of news was that um, the Longwood Gardens in uh, Pennsylvania, one of the most important uh, gardens, uh, you know, as a whole that we have on the East Coast is undergoing a major res renovation. And within that garden is a an exquisite um, a gem of a, a, a repository of about 200 native Brazilian plants that uh, Burle Marx had, had uh, brought there and created uh, a small uh, protected site for, and it had been quite neglected. But I think after the Botanical Gardens did their show, uh, the Longwood Gardens decided that they were going to spend six or $7 million to now completely renovate and um, uh, show that work. So our, our catalog is nearing completion. I hope it'll be ready in the beginning of next year, along with an exhibition of um, the jewelry we have, because we never stop collecting it. We cannot resist it. And um, we also cannot stop writing this catalog because we meet one more interesting person after another uh, with more news and information um, and stories to tell that we feel should be included. But I think uh, one day we are going to stop and the catalog <laughs> will come out. But it is a work of, of passion and commitment and I hope it will it will also make a small contribution to the overall story of of Burle Marx and I'm going to turn it over uh, to Isabella to have the last word. Thank you. So uh, as we are talking in the beginning, the Institute collection have a lot of uh, objects. So the drawing, the original drawings, the sketches, the photographs, uh, the painting plans documents, letter, and historical uh, material. And in October 30, we are opened our first exhibition. That's gonna be, can the next slide, please. The first exhibition of the, the unpublished uh, material, drawings, and in the classic projects the, of our collection. And it will be at uh, Roberto Marinho's house, and the garden was also made by Burle Marx in the 50s. So it's nice to have a beautiful private house that now it's became an institute. And then we have all this uh, unpublished material. So it's gonna be a, a challenge because it will be the first public action of the institute and a great opportunity to enlarge the knowledge of Burle Marx and his partner history. So we have an enormous legacy, as you can see, a lot of work to do. We have just set up out our institute. So we are joining uh, efforts to preserve all these unique collections and to develop future uh, cultural and educational actions that can celebrate all these contributions. So if you want to know more about our institute, you can visit or to participate, you can visit our website and the website of Brazil Foundation. That is a, we have a partnership with them. Thank you. And we, there is a beautiful, um, there is a beautiful yeah. phrase of uh, speech of Burle Marx that I want to leave for us. Can you read that? Yes, it's a true that art and of gardening did not begin with me, nor will end with me. But I believe that my experience can be useful to those who will come after me. It's like a generosity that he left for us when he donated the situ, when he preserved uh, all the, the material in his archive, when others, uh, partners and 
worked together to preserve all this material and to put it together. And now we are doing the same in this, the Institute. So we have all this generosity that he thought he, he, he teach for us, he taught for us. Thank you. Thank you too for in the invitation. There is our website here, so. And please be in touch with Isabella with any questions you have about the Instituto or about the discussion we just had um, or us about the jewelry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. And thank you, Jewelry Week. <laughs>